Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and today we're going to have a fantastic and incredible episode. We have a lot of news to cover over the weekend, lots of things to discuss. Uh, first thing we're going to discuss is the second assassination attempt of Trump, what that means, what's that saying about America, and what to infer from that. Uh, we've got also a lot of great questions from our Cognitive Elite members. We have about uh, there's two other topics I want to discuss before we get into uh, those great questions. But first, we need to talk about the assassination attempt. There is just so much news uh, happening in just one short day. There were two big news events that uh, would have been served as great podcast topics on their own. And then this popped up. So we have this uh, assassin and it's a 50 or eight year old man named ryan ralph we're gonna call him ralph the one great thing is i had to spend 30 minutes uh looking through local news footage to see the correct pronunciation because all my fans get pissed off if i don't use the correct pronunciation and generally the way they were saying it was ryan ralph and it due to america it can be ruth or ralph um but most of the newscasters were saying Ralph. We're going to say Ralph. If it's Ruth, that is not my fault. That is, <laughs> that is the fault of the newscasters. The only one who called him Ruth was a uh, local black reporter. And so uh, by inference, I decided that the four or five who were saying Ralph were the correct ones. Um, but even it was tough to find the police. But uh, in any case, we're calling him Ryan Ralph in this episode. Now. We have Ryan Routh is the suspect. Uh, incredibly weird background for someone. This guy is a long criminal rap sheet, convicted felon, uh, has been in the news many times. You know, he's been way in the past. He was considered a crime fighter. Uh, now he was most recently in the news for trying to recruit foreign fighters to Ukraine. He was profiled in the New York Times. I think Semaphore did a video with him. He was frequently interviewed and talked to about efforts to recruit foreign fighters to Ukraine. And he seemed to be well engaged in, in that. And also he had apparently met the Minister of Defense in Ukraine. And so there's something this is extremely weird that this guy tries to kill Trump. And so this is unlike in the last one, I think there's much more case to see if there's a possible conspiracy here because in the past case there are weird things about it that the fact that they allowed this teenager you know nobody was paying attention to him and then or well people were paying attention to him but not the people who would have done something about it were paying attention to him and it was a complete shit show that they allowed this guy to nearly kill trump and the only reason he didn't kill trump is trump turned his head at the last second to where it only grazes his ear rather than rent straight through his head. You know, he nearly died. And it was totally law enforcement's fault that that happened there. So there's something weird in that case. But I think in the last assassin's t attempt, it was simply this kid was a loser, wanted to make a name for himself. I don't even think it was quite political. It's a similar assassination attempt to the guy who tried to kill George Wallace during the 1972 presidential campaign. This is just a weirdo, wacky guy, wanted to make him name for himself, and he picked George Wallace as the easiest big name politician to get to get close to, and he shot him. And so that's why I chose him. I think we'll eventually find that out, that that was the case. I know it's a, it's a lot easier to say, oh, it's an inside attempt. There was a second shooter and all this stuff. I mean, it's fine to look into. I don't really believe it. I do believe uh, it was just this guy. Now, here in this case, uh, this is really weird. I can suspect that this guy, you know, this guy is talking to a lot of people in Ukraine. This guy, you know, he boasts of his contacts. Apparently, the Minister of Defense even knows him. And I would have guessed that somebody, a lot of these guys over in Ukraine are worried about Trump. They think that he's going to cut off funding to Ukraine. And probably one of them suggested is like, wow, wouldn't it be great if someone took Trump out? And this guy being uh, a strange individual and, you know, well, 
a very strange individual, you know, the fact that he's this, but he was able to establish some legitimacy among, you know, media reporters, among Ukrainians. And this guy is like, oh, it's my job to save Ukraine. And the only way I can save Ukraine is by assassinating Trump. And I guarantee that this is in his mind. Now, was there a direct order sent? Uh, I don't think Ukraine would be that stupid to do so. But, <laughs> I mean, Ukrainians are a little nuts. I mean, the, the type of assassinations and ops that they've tried to do, uh, you know, in Russia, they are starting to blame the Ukrainians for the Nord Stream pipeline, Belas. I don't know if they have the ability to do that. I think that was just America. But maybe America just said, sure. I mean, the official story is that it was Ukraine that did it and that we tried to call it off and then Ukraine just went ahead and did it. And so they do have this brazenness to them that they are willing to do this. So I, I think it's fully possible here. I don't really believe the conspiracy angle here, but I'm willing to see a conspiracy angle here. And the conspiracy comes from straight from Ukraine and that this guy Somebody, I mean, they may have, I don't think it would have been a direct order, but I think there were suggestions and talk about how, wow, you know, Trump's going to be really bad. We really need somebody to do something about this. And this guy's like, oh, well, I'm not doing a good job recruiting foreign fighters. I'm going to do something for Ukraine. And so he went and tried to assassinate him. And it's also just not even just that. It's just the hysteric tone uh, of the mainstream media. This is you know, people are like, how could this happen? And it's like, look at, look at the violent tone. And you even had the media outlets go straight to their talking points. One, they blame Trump for this. They did this back in 2017 when there was an assassination attempt of all these Republican congressmen. Apparently, Trump was at fault for this libtard trying to kill Republican congressmen. And so it was uh, the duty of everyone to lower the tone. But only Republicans lowered the tone. And then... Democrats went straight to back to claiming Republicans are trying to kill. They're trying to do a genocide against elderly people. And people were using this rhetoric. It was insane rhetoric. They used that same rhetoric during COVID when they're like, Trump is committing a genocide against the people by not taking COVID seriously or by not wearing a mask. And this was rhetoric repeated on mainstream news outlets. Now you've seen always a great threat to democracy. Democracy might end if Trump is president. He's going to become a dictator. All our freedoms are going to go away. And you're seeing these people get, you know, their mind warped by this stuff. And then there's surprises like, oh, wow, I can't believe anyone's trying to kill Trump. And so this guy, I think, you know, he clearly had very liberal views. They're trying to claim like, oh, his views are all over the place, you know, whatever. No, this guy's a Ukraine NAFO libtard. You know, this is this guy is fully on Team Blue. This guy is not Team Red. They can't say that with this kid with uh, who shot him, who tried to, sh or he did shoot him, and back in July. That kid, you know, based on it, you know, they, he has. There are reports of multiple different politics with this kid. But I mean, he's a teenager. Teenagers don't really have really solidified political views. They'll have different politics depending on the day. So <clears throat> I don't think you can really say much there. But this guy, definitely a liberal, definitely a libtard. And his son even was like, oh, you know, the, the, the response to this, I actually go to the second reason that they're trying to claim. They're trying to claim that this guy is an accelerationist. They're trying to also to say that this guy is a right-wing extremist. They try to do that also with the kid who tried to assassinate him back in July. Now they're trying to run with this, which this is just ridiculous. This guy is not a far-right extremist. He is a libtard. He is a liberal. He is nothing but that. And to claim, yeah, does his politics be a little incoherent? Yes. Is the guy a little schizophrenic and mentally ill? Yeah, but still. We're not going to blame mental illness on this. This guy is a political assassin who is motivated by political ideology. And the ideology that likely spurred him, specific are the causes specifically spurred him on, was Ukraine. I would say that that's my suspicion. I would say that he, I don't think he was quite ordered, but I think he could have received encouragement from Ukrainians. He knew that something must be done about Trump because they're worried about Trump cutting off funding. And they prefer Biden, or not Biden, but Harris being president 
the next term. They think that she would be more likely to guarantee your Ukraine funding than than Trump. And considering how, you know, the brazenness of Ukrainian intelligence in both trying to do assassination attempts in, within Russia and terror attacks within Russia, also that they're now being blamed for Nord Stream, uh, the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline, even though I think that might have had more American involvement. But it's not, if Ukraine had the ability to do that, they would absolutely 100 percent do that. So I, I can see them trying to go through their American context to be like, hey, you know, it'd be a good idea. And then suggesting this. So I think that that's my I think that's like we said, we don't fully know this, but I think it's reasonable to suspect that. I mean, this guy had, he's, had those connections. I mean, this wasn't just some random nobody. So this guy is crazy, and he was crazy, but I think, you know, crazy people can still do things for political reasons. As we can see a lot in the far right. So we have that. Now, the general culture of supporting assassination attempt. The first time they did, they tried, they had to have sympathy, but they, you know, the media was almost forced to have sympathy for Trump. And he was nearly shot at. This is big news that, you know, there was this, and people are getting fired over this. But now that we're in, you know, full sway of the campaign, you know, they have their person they want to to campaign for, the media does, and Kamala, much more so than they did with Biden. And they really don't want to give the sympathy to Trump over this. They really want to move on to blaming Trump for his own assassination attempt and saying that he's responsible for this rhetoric. And they want to go back to him hating on Taylor Swift and hating on Haitians and say that he's just so dangerous and radical. They really do not want to have, give the sympathy boost to Trump for this. So they're going to try to move on as quickly as possible from this assassination attempt and just say uh, they'll even have some their own conspiracy theories that Trump staged this like he they all these liberals try to claim that he staged the first assassination attempt even though it nearly killed him or glass shattered and hit him in the ear you know even the FBI director tried to claim that because they're trying to downplay the threat to Trump and so they're going to try to claim this and even with uh you know one of the Vindman's uh Alexander Vindman, who's one of these libtard heroes, he was an, an impeachment eyewitness against Trump and his fat hog of a wife, you know, was making fun of Trump, like no ears harm, go back to your normal Sunday. And that's good. The dismissive attitude is going to be what liberals want because they don't they know this is going to play to Trump's advantage in the election and they don't want that. So they're going to quickly move on to other topics. But it, and it is. I think the first time they were like, oh, you know, because Trump was out of this bounce. They're, you know, almost resigned to the fact that Trump's going to have a second term because they knew Biden can't, couldn't beat him. And they were more focused on trying to get rid of Biden. And thus they were able to show more sympathy. This time they don't want to do that. And it's like even with them interviewing this guy, uh, Ralph's dumbass son, who got on TV and was like, my dad would never do this. My dad's nonviolent. Well, your dad did it. And then he spent the whole time blaming Trump. <laughs> it's like, he's like, every reasonable person hates Trump. And you know what? Trump caused this. And it's like, this is outrageous. We would have never allowed like a family member of Lee Harvey Oswald or the guy who tried to kill Reagan to go in and then blame the president <laughs> for that. That doesn't happen. But here the media is like, hmm, how is Trump responsible for him nearly dying again? You know, that's the line they want to go on, but they want to move away from this. And it is insane, you know, this middle of a presidential election and Trump has had two assassination attempts. Two. We might have a third or a fourth, you know, and maybe those might succeed um, against him. I mean, we, you know, a month and a half until the election. And that's still plenty of time for this. And they've been mocking Trump for having, you know, this like this um, plexiglass. Uh, I, I don't know. I guess it would be plexiglass, you know, seal around him as he speaks. What other presidential candidate has had two pres uh, like serious uh, assassination attempts? 
I mean, I, there's been ones with <laughs> successful assassination attempts like RFK, uh, but you know, he's had two in a span of two months. Or you know, so what? What do you what do you expect here? You know, yeah. I, if I was Trump, I would just like hide <laughs> and only do it in this like uh, sealed uh, sealed container at the at his at his rallies because it's just insane, and, and the media is fanning the flames here and so yeah I, I think it's we're not out of the woodwork yet i was always surprised there weren't more assassination attempts of trump uh when he was president or when he was running for president for the first time i mean they had the guy who come out came on stage who tried to attack him or tackle him i i don't think the guy Maybe the guy tried to kill him, but the guy was just trying to assault him, which is still, you know, not something you're supposed to do against a presidential candidate. But I, I thought there had been like more guys trying to snipe at him. Didn't happen. Now this time, you've had two, and both times could have been successful. I mean, the the first time, it only it almost succeeded. The only reason it didn't succeed is Trump turned his head at the last moment. This time. Secret Service actually did their job and noticed him before he, you know, Trump had appeared on the course or on that specific hole and engaged the Ralph and the Ralph um, fled after the Secret Service engaged him. So, you know, that's uh, that's insane. It's the moment we're half. So, uh, you know, they're trying to kill Trump and they want and they feel the only way they can stop him is through killing him. And I think if he increases his poll numbers, you're going to see another, you you might see another assassination attempt. There's a lot of crazy people out there. And there's a lot of people who would feel that they're a martyr. And the response you're going to see to this guy is that this guy had his heart in the right place. <laughs> as already as his son said, it's like he wouldn't do such a thing. But if he did, it's all, it's entirely Trump's fault. And I think the media wants to run with that line. They don't want to give Trump uh, a victory here. They don't want to give him sympathy boost. And it's obviously going to help Trump. So there's going to be more details come out about this, but that's my initial thoughts. I want to go on to two other topics uh, before we get to the kind of elite. Uh, first, or well, second now, is Trump's battle with uh, Taylor Swift. Uh, Trump had a just a straight post right before he was nearly assassinated again, or I don't know if he nearly assassinated again, or suffered another assassination attempt. He tweeted in all caps, or he truth socialed, in all caps, I hate Taylor Swift. <laughs> and um, I wouldn't say this is the smartest politics, but I <laughs> this was a very funny post. It's just like, imagine in the morning, you know, he's just up. He's just like, I want to tweet something. I'm going to tweet in all caps, I hate Taylor Swift. <laughs> and, uh, you know, maybe not the best idea to... Um, engage a flame war with America's most popular celebrity. But uh, you know what? I, I'm saying this, you know, Trump, it's election time. I'm going to trust most of Trump's decisions and just say they're really uh, whatever they're right. Even the thing, you know, even some of the stuff at the debate, you know, I was like, maybe you shouldn't say that. But you know what? I, I think whatever he does, I'm going to fully support. Unless he comes out, does more of the stuff like we need more immigrants. That's like the only, that and other like things that sound like hucking you can, you can challenge on. But anything of just like his funny feuds and other things, I'm just like, it's great content. I'm fully supporting it. You know, like him saying, you know, a political strategist would probably say, don't say they eat the dogs, they eat the cats, they're eating the pets. Don't say that. Uh, but look at him saying that now that's like, you know, it's turned into a popular TikTok song. People thought it was hilarious and people are now investigating what the Haitian migrants are doing in Ohio. And they're finding evidence that they are, in fact, eating cats. You know, uh, Chris Rufo had that video of them barbecuing a cat, which there's now disputes saying it's not a cat. But um, he has pretty good sources saying it's a cat. So. It, well, it's not from Springfield, and it's by African migrants, but it's nearby. You know, migrants in Ohio eating cats. And that was Trump's basic point. So uh, who, who's going to sweat the details here? And I think his battle with uh, Taylor Swift, 
you know, I would say that this is maybe not the smartest reason, but he might as well engage the feud anyway, because Taylor Swift is initiating it by campaigning for, by endorsing Kamala. And we've been talking about this a long time, about what a political impact Taylor Swift could have. And she will have some impl- impact. Polling has showed that, a, that there is a sizable number of Americans who say that her endorsement would influence them. Back in the first time Republicans were at war with her and saying she's a deep state op, you know, there were polling showing that nearly one in five Americans said that her endorsement would influence who they would uh, change in their, or who, who they would pick in the presidential election. New polling shows it's not that big of a factor. I mean, 66% said it would not impact them at all. 8% or so said it would make them more likely to vote for Kamala after the endorsement. But then 20% said it makes them less likely to vote for Kamala Harris. But I think the 20% saying that are hardcore Trumpers who are really mad that she would uh, endorse Kamala. So I would say an 8% might be Democrats who are already voting. But it is... It is, it does matter because Taylor Swift is the avatar of white middle class women with a college education. Well, you know, middle class, white college educated women, particularly ones without children. And Democrats are banking on this demographic to win the election because, and that's why they're emphasizing abortion as their number one issue. It's why they're so excited over the Taylor Swift thing. And they're all now like regurgitating Taylor Swift lyrics to this. I mean, Kamala released some idiotic press statement drawn up by one of her, I would have said millennial intern. It could be, uh, uh, hopefully no millennials are still interns, but drawn up by one of her millennial female staffers. It could be even a Zoomer, depending on how young they are. It's probably a 30 year old who thinks she's still 23. Any case, she, they wrote this up and it included all these uh, Taylor Swift lyrics. You're gonna have, you saw Liz Cheney using Taylor Swift lyrics. You're gonna, they're gonna put out Tim Walsh to regurgitate Taylor Swift lyrics to to come to respond to um, to Trump and all the lyrics because all of Taylor Swift's lyrics are about uh, crazy or her uh, dysfunctional relationships and crazy ex boyfriends or her being crazy about ex-boyfriends or her being mad that her ex-boyfriend left her you know that's now what it is it's like trump is the shitty ex-boyfriend you had and you're glad you dumped him and that's trying to really you know make their entire campaign center around the worldview of these college educated white women who generally are without children and so they're hoping to boost this. They're trying to really turn this demographic into blacks. It's like the hardest core democratic demographic that they can turn them out and that they'll vote over 70% for Democrats. And they're hoping Taylor Swift can, can help achieve that goal. I think that there is enough evidence that she can do that. But there is a chance that it turns the Kamala campaign into something that other voters don't want to vote for. And I don't like the multiracial working class angle, but this, it does turn off black and Hispanic voters. They're like, man, this is just all for these wealthy white women. I don't want to, this is a Karen campaign and I don't want to vote for this. And so the, and, and this across the board, even black women, they're like, why the hell are we focused on this rich white girl? Granted, I don't like the politics. I don't think Donald Trump should lean into that. Like, oh, they're now the Karen party. But I think you should just re- let voters assume on their own and let them you know, decide whether they want to vote for this party. And they view Kamala as an out-of-touch party, the Taylor Swift party. There's a lot of people, and that also absolutely working class. Whites don't want to vote for that. And even a lot of men who are just white middle-class men who are tired of Taylor Swift fandom are going to be like, I, I don't want to vote for these horrible women I'm having to go on dates with as a millennial. So I, I'm going to go and vote for Trump. I think it turns off a lot of the other voters that they need to win the election as it becomes just an entire campaign built around winning this one demographic that pretty much all other American demographics are annoyed by. Some people are having to put them up. I mean, college-educated white men are having to put up with them because that's who they're generally dating and you know trying to wife up but other demographics are just annoyed by this 
this one. And it's a very successful, wealthy, powerful demographic, and it creates resentment. And if they, if that's everything, and then you have Walls and Kamala basically spending their whole time reciting Taylor Swift lyrics, people are just like, um, you know, I'm gonna maybe I'll just sit at home. Uh, this is just not a campaign for me. And so they all like they'll do that. Now, uh, if Taylor Swift actually goes out and campaigns. For Kamala, that's pro that it's not a good thing, because you know that will that will get her seventy five percent of the college educated, not white, a single female voter, and that might be enough to to shift the election. And you could hope that it turns off enough voters, but uh, I mean that's like getting there. You know, I, it's getting their furor. You know, she really is the furor of that demographic. So she, uh, they're getting her out there to uh, campaign for them. So I don't think Taylor Swift is going to go far enough into that because she, you know, she is a sassy, uh, sassy, I guess she is sassy, savvy businesswoman who, you know, has made herself a billionaire through smart marketing and smart image uh, control. And I think going full out for the Democratic campaign is something that she doesn't really want to take that risk to do. And, you know, she has to, she has to sit in the booth with Brittany Mahomes. So Brittany Mahomes is now a Trump supporter. So, you know, she might not want to do that. Uh, hopefully the, the big white pill would be Brittany Mahomes and Taylor Swift and opposing boxes uh, when they're at the Chiefs game. That would be a real white pill. That would show Brittany Mahomes as, uh, as a full-on loyal Trump supporter. You know, Trump's been promising that we're going to be burning more coal. And the whole Mahomes family has heard and listened to that message. And so we are glad the Mahomes family is, is on the Trump train. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, we have them uh, going there because Mahomes' mom is also a Trump supporter. She was like really into Stop the Steal. So now his wife is. Uh, Mahomes himself might be a Trump voting for Trump because they asked him about that. He's like, oh, I don't want to do you know, deal with politics. Uh, but unfortunately, Caitlin Clark seems to be wanting to vote for Kamala. She liked the post, but then she's like, I don't want to deal with politics. Well, you like Taylor Swift's post. And it's like, I think people should get involved in politics. Well, uh yeah, what did your what did that like post say? So Caitlin Clark, even though she's become a right wing symbol of white America, she still couldn't resist uh, standing with her uh, her identity block, which is even though she's like twenty three, she's she's still an unmarried, college educated white woman, and thus she stood in solidarity with her identity group uh, for Kamala. But she didn't go out with a full endorsement, which we can um, which we can appreciate. Now, Trump picking a fight with her, there is the worry that she might go on campaign. But I think it's she's already picked a fight. And Trump being Trump, he let him let him do his feuds. Anytime people thought his feuds were stupid, whether he's feuding with John McCain, whether he's feuding with John, uh, with Paul Ryan, whether he's feuding with Jeff Sessions, whether he's feuding with whoever, even like some of those, like I didn't like his feud with Jeff Sessions. But generally, it is the nature of Trump. This is what he does. Uh, I thought his people are like he shouldn't feud with Ron DeSantis. Look at look at how that turned out. Turned out pretty well for him. He t turned it. He feuded with Liz Cheney. That turned out into a major win for him, and it purged the party of the Cheneys. Just you know, you would think that sometimes his feuds aren't going to work. You know, just let him be Trump. I think it's hilarious that he's saying, I hate Taylor Swift. You know, and I've said articles in favor of Taylor Swift, like saying like she is a nice bourgeois white identity. You know, there's no tattoos. There's no drug abuse. She still dates white guys. You know, most of the white guys are still fine. <laughs> I mean, Travis Kelsey... Maybe not the smartest guy ever, but he is a you know a masculine football player. And I guess that's a nice image to uh, to tell young women is like they need to get a traditionally masculine guy, but hopefully less wiggerish and smarter than Travis Kelsey. Uh, with that, 
but you know, there's a lot worse pop stars and celebrities that women can follow. And so Taylor Swift is like nice bourgeois middle class norms, but and she's trying to use that imagery to turn against Trump to get the white middle class to vote against Trump. And Trump, you know, he's a counterpuncher, and he is now reacting in kind. Should he uh, double down on his war with Taylor Swift? I don't know. It gets him a lot of media attention, and maybe it baits Democrats into going into this out of touch. I don't know if Karen. Be- well, we we need to return Becky the Becky stereotype back because Becky was less for those who don't remember Becky was the old anti-white slur the white that blacks use for white women but Becky was younger white woman Karen is middle-aged we need the middle-aged women we're pro we're not going to get many Beckys uh so we're going to use Beckys here and if they become the party of Beckys of these uh uh unbearable insufferable 30 something women who, you know, are cat ladies, they can't get a boyfriend, and they see as their avatar Taylor Swift, and this becomes the mascot of the Democratic Party, that's going to make other people not want to vote for them. And so making the Democrats campaign entirely on Taylor Swift lyrics and showing that they are not responding to any other issues around the country about the economy, about immigration, about crime, about education. I think this could be turned to Trump's advantage. And he is doing that by baiting these Democrats into that response. And they sh- Democrats should absolutely not be relying on Taylor Swift lyrics to do this because it's just like cringe way of politics. Whenever politicians try to be culturally relevant and they're not Trump, it comes off as forced and just straight cringe. Nobody is won over by that. But Democrats want to run on that and let them run on that. So. Trump, Trump's not going to win the Becky demographic. He's just not. And his supporters like this. And he just just let let the feud happen. I think it's funny. I think it's keck. I, I thought it was hilarious. They're just tweeting out, I hate Taylor Swift. Uh, let's have some more Taylor Swift posts. I think he should. I think it's one of his better feuds. I think it's much better... Hopefully he does it. It's also better for that to be the thing than for J.D. Vance to go out there and try to explain the Childless Cat Lady thing. They should not be attacking Childless Cat Lady. Just attack Taylor Swift. It's much better to rather have a direct on attack against the whole demographic, but just go after the avatar against the representative of that. And Trump has taken on a lot of popular figures, even taken on the Pope. You know, I remember in the 2016 campaign, he's like, he's now starting a feud with the Pope. Guess what? He still won. You know, let him work his magic. I think it's fine. It's much better than him talking about how we need more immigrants here. So I think right now the rhetoric coming from the campaign is awesome. Uh, like they're do what they're doing with the re- immigrants. I mean, Trump is talking about remigration. This is the final topic before I get into the questions. Is the increasingly strong rhetoric over the immigrants? Right now, the Republican Party is the message on migrants is that they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats, and we need to re-migrate them out of the country. I mean, Trump even had a long statement saying, I can end uh, their asylum protections and temporary protected status, and we can get them out of the country, otherwise known as re-migration. The fact that he's bringing in re-migration, uh, you know, a very controversial but based, very keyed slogan phrase from europe and bringing that into an american context is very strong we need to have that idea that even though these guys are here illegally we can take that away and then deport them out of the country and we need to have that re-migration um, idea percolate throughout american politics and get people on board with that and why we need that because there's a lot of there's been a lot of tweets and posts like saying well they're here legally so what do we do about this i saw some like black pill posts like from people like saying oh well only a super majority in congress can get rid of temporary protected status that's only the program trump as president can take that uh tps away courts have ruled that he can do that and the courts you know you can make them more conservative uh, the Supreme Court with its, you know, even though there's people, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, you know, there's people on there that he maybe needs to worry about. He can still get approval for removing migrants from TPS and then start deporting them. 
I'd actually say ACB would vote against it because she adopted Haitians. She's like, no, my precious Haitians. No, don't get rid of them. They're based. They're Catholic. Um, whatever. But they're going to still. There's like these people are like saying, oh, these guys are devout Catholics. I'm like, what? First off, like I've been hearing from people who like in random southern towns, you know, rural towns that are now getting all these Haitians. First off, they're not even Catholic. They're like they're some variant of protestant also a lot of them mix in voodoo with whatever religion whatever christian denomination they have so it's like oh wow we're revitalizing catholic catholicism through this of uh syncretic voodoo religion wow that's awesome uh yeah let's let's uh, that's just the dumbest arguments i'm tired of the contrarianism uh coming from some people any case that's like well it's like okay yeah, we can kick them off. We can't rid of, eliminate the program, but Trump can kick off specific nationalities from it and then deport them. The program will still exist, but if you get fewer migrants off it, then that means we can get rid of them. Like, get them back out of the country. And most people are supporting these ideas, especially among Republicans. So, you know, over 60% of Americans support mass deportations. And it's not like Americans are really fond of these Haitians. There's other posts like saying like, oh, people are proposing solutions. They're just proposing racism. First off, uh, base. Second off, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever you call is racism, it's actually making, showing pro uh, progress in how Republicans address this issue. They are, a, the rhetoric over the Haitian migrants is some of the strongest rhetoric we've ever seen from the right in years. You know, there's no, there's nothing. It's all, it's everything involved. It's like they're taking the jobs, they're ruining communities. They're not, they're unassimilable, unassimilable. You know, they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats. They're just like, they're full of crime. And also there's even the rhetoric coming from Don Jr. Don Jr. had, Donald Trump Jr. had one of the strongest statements about immigrants. He said, they are coming from a failed state. They have low IQ. Let's look at the demographics of this country. And they're just going to lower America's IQ. And that's like, wow, we're in introducing race realism into the, here. And you're even seeing this from coming from the, from people at these uh, town halls where they're saying, like, look, they're coming from a failed state. They can't, they can't manage to have a state of their own. And if they become the majority of a town, our town's going to look like Port-au-Prince. We don't want to look, look like Port-au-Prince. We want to look like America. And so you're seeing the, a much better rhetoric come from this. And people want to complain. It's like, oh, they're getting bomb threats. They're getting all this stuff. It's like, you know, maybe the town should have thought about that before inviting them here. And all these employers are saying, oh, they're way better than the Americans. Oh, the Americans are just drug addicts and lazy. And then they're like, oh, people are protesting. You just called all the town's people like lazy drug addicts. What do you expect people are going to be mad about this? Maybe you should have thought of that before giving these media interviews talking about how awesome Haitians are. And then, you know, we're in a democracy. People can voice protest. And they want to claim like, oh, some of them are violent threats. I bet most of them are just people calling and being angry. You know, and then these schools are spending tons of money on the Haitian migrants anyway. You know, it's, uh, I, I get so mad. It's like, oh, the heated rhetoric, all this stuff. You know, we spent like uh, all the Trump administration you know, going after random people who said something racist on the internet, or we're even just Trump supporters. And now when people are, you know, showing a backlash towards, you know, their schools and businesses and their town getting overrun by, you know, Haitian migrants, they then want to be like, oh no. I, I, and I think that most even this stuff is just made up. Like the threats, they, they do that because they run to the media. So the media can then demand censorship and the media can dem blame Trump and they can blame Elon Musk and they can blame X. So you shouldn't fall for this trap. You know, you shouldn't fall for this trap in, in the case. And in any, in any way, it's like people don't like that the Haitians are, in, are there. There's going to be conflict and tension. And they're showing that they know that they've worn out their welcome. And if they, you know, if the Haitians don't like that they're no longer receiving a welcome, they can go somewhere else. You know, they're not, you know, the town is not legally required to be 100% welcoming to a community that they don't want there. So, uh, 
you know, I, I don't like the sob stories that they're trying to promote. And it's it's done solely to hurt Trump, and it's done to hurt and demonize these ordinary Springfielders who simply don't want the Haitians there. And the fact that they're the vast majority of them are doing standard levels of protest and writing complaints. They're not making bomb threats. They're not making shooting threats. And they're trying to demonize that as violent rhetoric is that they can no longer go to these city council meetings and say anything bad about the Haitians because, oh, that's words equal violence. And that's what they're trying to do here. So people shouldn't fall for that. And, you know, whatever. Um, but I think that the rhetoric, uh, the rhetorical changes are huge, are huge development among Republicans. And the fact that they're like, oh, they're contributing to our businesses and small, you know, to business growth. And even like what Mike DeWine is saying, that is falling on flat ears, uh, on deaf ears, rather flat ears. I don't know if <laughs> I think people use that, but falling on deaf ears with Republicans and ordinary Republicans. And then they're going with a much stronger message as defined by Don Jr., Trump's and even JD Vance. So, and I think what Chris Rufo did was remarkable work. You know, I give a lot of criticism to Rufo, but I think him showing off that video of them uh, having a cat barbecue in nearby Dayton and African migrants is is setting the message in the Republic. And this stuff is deeply unsettling to Americans. Like the fact that we're welcoming migrants who are killed, as I argued in my article last week, we have a deep revulsion towards people who eat pets. You know, this is a very pet centric country. We love cats and dogs and to see migrants eating cats and dogs is deeply unsettling to Americans. And we can find more evidence of them doing this and migrants doing this in various parts of America. And there's a, even in New York City where they're having various you know, third world cults come to America and they're now sacrificing animals and they're finding tons of animals. It's not just voodoo and Santeria. It's also Hindus, uh, various Hindu sects that are involved in it as well. Uh, you know, if they want to have this debate, you know, they should continue because we're going to find a lot more evidence of them killing animals uh, and particularly pets. And Democrats are going to have to run on defending that. So... And we're going to and I think this is going to be a very sharp, strong message for Republicans in this election. Uh, so in conclusion, with both the Taylor Swift thing and they're eating the dogs, they're eating the cats. Uh, I'm trusting Trump here on this. And I think he should, you know, we people want him or saying, let Trump be Trump. Let Trump be Trump. Uh, I think it'll be it'll turn out well. I think the second assassination attempt is going to give him a sympathy boost. Kamala is going to just stick to having her interns and, and comms people write up idiotic press statements using utilizing Taylor Swift lyrics. And this is just not going to connect with people. So I think it's uh, been a pretty strong few days for Trump. And I, I think people need to be really white pilled. I, I think the campaign, the rhetoric from the campaign and the agenda that they're running on is as strong as it was as almost as strong as it was in 2016. I think it, you could even argue it's stronger than in 2016 because we just were not used to what happened in 2016. And we have this unique meme energy and uh, and these, you know, limitless expectations that we could have seen from Trump. Now, you know, it's, uh, you know, there's a little bit more cynicism or a little bit more realism uh, coming into play and our expectations are a little bit more limited. But... What he's saying right now in the campaign that he's running at the moment and rhetorically is you even bringing in Laura Loomer and he's not even really condemning Laura Loomer and they're all trying to say Laura Loomer's a racist and whatever. You know, I, I think it's a I think it's a pretty strong campaign right now at the moment. So I'm white pilled and I think you should be as well. So with on that note, we're going to move on to the Convalete questions. As a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Convalete option at Highly Respected Substack. And that's at highly-respected.com. And make sure to sign up for the IQ supplements while you're there. We're going to start off with KMAX. KMAX has two questions this week. He's got a mailbag question, but we'll have this. Actually, I should have brought this up because this is a horrible thing, but he asked this question, so I was going to save this for a convlete. He says, the pathological altruism whites and how to get rid of it. A white man loses his son to a Haitian murderer, and his first thought is 
How do I protect the Haitians and their feelings? Not for his own dead son. No black parent ever says they would lose a child or someone uh, white that they worry about the white community in which their kid was killed by someone black. Was one thing that inspired you to be proactive because of events like this? How do we breed this out of ourselves? No other group in human history has ever done this. Well, uh, I don't know if being proactive about this, but I need to talk about this. Is that Aiden Clark's dad, Aiden Clark, was this 11-year-old who was on a school bus when a Haitian driver driving the wrong way drove right into the bus and the bus veered over and hurt several children and it killed Aiden Clark. The father went up to the city council angry. Not at Haitians, not at the people responsible for this, not at the people who are allowing Haitians to have driver's license even when they shouldn't, or be driving cars even though they're all wrecking these cars and not and everyone's reporting that they're bad drivers. No, his anger was directed entirely at Republicans because how dare they use my son? It's like he was sick and he's like, they're disgusting for using his son who is killed by terrible immigration policies and killed by these policies that are allowing these people who shouldn't have driver's license to have driver's licenses. And his whole response was just attacking Republicans. And then at one point he said, I wish my son was killed by an old white man so we could protect the Haitians. And uh, he went all in on how awesome the Haitians are. And this is even worse than the Molly Tibbetts family. The Molly Tibbetts family... If you guys remember, Molly Tibbetts was an uh, Iowa college student who was raped and murdered by an illegal immigrant. And the parents were separated, but both the parents came out with horrible responses. The father came out with a response fully defending the Hispanic community, saying that they have great food and Molly Tibbetts would be defending them today if she, of course, hadn't been raped and murdered by one of them. Uh, but he did this whole column and everyone's like, this guy is awesome. The liberal media loved it. And the mom, the mom to one up the father adopted one of the friends of the guy who had killed her daughter. And then the guy convinced the mother to forgive and to sympathize with the rape with her daughter's rapist and murderer. And though I think it was the Washington Post and New York Times who profiled this and they were just like, this is so awesome. This is what whites need to do. Not only do they need to defend migrants, but they need to forgive and love their, you know, their children's killer. And this is what this guy is doing here. And it's the reason why they do this. Some people have been pointing out at the DOJ group that goes and sends people out to lower social tensions. And maybe he did get a talking to from this group. They've been involved in a lot of cases where like someone's kid gets killed and then they go and talk and it's like, well, you need to lower the temperature and welcome these migrants. And they've done this before. Uh, I think it could have been involved there. I need to look into that a little bit more. But even outside of that, there's a social rewards for this because this guy, everyone in the media is like, oh, but this guy is awesome. I love to hear this. And they did this for the Molly Tibbetts family. The parents were turned into, you know, they could be potential pariahs because there's been other families who've been caring about this. There was a girl in Georgia who her, you know, was raped and murdered by a migrant. I don't know, rape. It was death. She was definitely murdered. And the family has gone to Trump events and has become full on Trump. I think they were already Trump supporters. But then they've gone uh, super MAGA. Uh, in response to this and demanding, you know, uh, totally and campaigning a lot on immigration events. And there's a lot of angel moms too, but they don't get paid attention to. The Tibbetts parents were turned into, you know, they got all these glowing profile pieces and like about how this is how you're supposed to respond to migrants. Even in the, when they profiled Molly Tibbetts mom, they pro, they showed another person who did not have the right response. This person was angry and bitter at immigrants for, his child's murder and death, which he shouldn't have that response. Contrast this to Molly Tibbetts' mom. Wow, awesome. Uh, the embodiment of American and Christian values. This is how you need to be. So there's a social rewards for this. And it's a lot of, I, I mean, I discussed this a little bit in a column last week about the response to this. You know, these were people not directly impacted by the Haitians, but they'll see them killing pets and, you know, driving horribly. And they're like, well, we still need to welcome them. You know, we don't have a choice. We need to be nice, good people. And so the reason why a lot of whites do this is they feel that, you know, the most 
the best thing they can do is turn the other cheek and welcome them in. And they exploit some of the Christian feeling around them. They definitely did that with the Tibbetts family who like to proclaim themselves as devout Catholics. I don't know if the Aiden Clark family is, but there's still even that latent cultural Christianity around it. I'm not blaming Christianity for this. I'm just saying that they're able to exploit those feelings and sentiments to say like, well, you know, this is the real good thing that people do. And even some of those values that have been secularized uh, among liberals, they do that. And it's like, you've got to always be charitable. And when you see an outsider do this, it's wrong to blame the, the outsider. You should forgive them. Now, if this is, as uh, K-Max was saying, if this is a black person who had been killed by a white person, they're, we're having a blood libel against all whites. All whites are responsible for this. Derek Chauvin was a representative of white America. White America killed George Floyd. White America killed Trayvon Martin, even though George Zimmerman wasn't white. You know, and white America killed Michael Brown. All the time, all whites are responsible, and the person res who uh, had done the killing is total evil. There's no forgiveness for them. <clears throat> and, but once switch the races, whites are just supposed to be forgiving and altruistic, and the only real crime is people trying to exploit this uh, killing for political gain, which no black family who's ever had a relative who shot at police and then was killed has ever seen that like they shouldn't exploit that for political gain. It's always open for political gain in, in the situation that arises. So I think the only way you can stop that is by public condemnation of this guy, of people of an equally negative response to this guy. And I think the fact that all of the right, you know, in the past, like there was a lot of people who were like, oh, we've got to listen to the Tibbets. But do the right being much better than it was in 2018, now the right is all attacking this guy. And, you know, it's not it's not good optics or it's maybe you, there should be a little bit of understanding. You know, it is, you know, he is going through a rough time, but you have to publicly condemn that. You have to show that there is social consequence, that there is social opprobrium for doing this insane activities. And if they only receive praise, if they only see social rewards, then more people are going to do that. But if there is a backlash to this, if there is social condemnation of this type of behavior, that's the only way to push whites into having a better response to these horrific atrocities done to their family. And to show that they should have a political response to this, as it was a political problem. You know, it's not like this guy just died in a mysterious car accident that could happen anyway. No, this guy died because of terrible immigration policies and terrible policies that allow Haitians who shouldn't be having driver's licenses to drive on the road. You know, it is that. Uh, second question from K-Max. Uh, Scott, the movie Am I Racist by Matt Walsh enters theaters this weekend. Finally, a film somewhat addressing our concerns in a defensive white identity way. In your view, do these films only preach to the choir or do films like this help our side grow? I just fear for the, these being like God is not deaf films where they are more made for parody. Would a Greerhead rule go be to go and see Am I Racist by Matt Walsh? I think it's fine. I think I think it's good because even though it's preaching the choir for the most part, it pushes conservatives into having a better arguments and, a, and make them more right wing. Because the film goes and explores how insane anti-white and how insanely anti-white the left is and it exposes it to a larger audience and mainly to conservatives. And I think it's important for conservatives to get that message and to have and to solidify and strengthen the response to that anti-white insanity. And so, yeah, there are problems with Walsh, uh, but I, I fully support this film. Uh, I kind of wanted to see I kind of want to see it, but I'm not sure if I will. I might, I might cringe in it because it's a lot of it's I like some of it's dopey humor. I've seen some of the clips. Some of the clips are very good. Some of them are not so good, but uh, I, I think it's totally fine to go and see it. I think it's, uh, I think, I think it's a good movie to take for your, like your conservative uncles and relatives and go and see it. And they'll be strengthened in their politics. Their politics will be made better by Walsh. We can wish for a better person than Walsh to do a film like this, but he's the one who did it. He, it's the one that it's in theaters nationwide. 
I don't. I see the other type of conservative films that they're doing. I mean, the, all the other conservative films that they're doing. There's now like a dozen human trafficking movies. It's like, uh, I, I don't. I'm. I'm. I understand why they're doing this because they're wanting to create the libs or pedophile angle with the movie, and these are very powerful messages to get out there. But I don't like that the whole conservatism is like obsessed with human trafficking because then that can make them instead of having an anti-immigration stance it makes them pro-immigrant because it's like oh they're exploiting the the libtards are exploiting these children for their pedophile cult so we need to rescue these kids and bring them to america it's like no 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 no. that's not the response to it but they're they're doing like a million uh, human trafficking movies it's like uh how about we do a movie about how like illegal aliens instead of them being exploited about how they're like killing uh, americans I, I would rather have a movie like that but in any case, I think the Am I Racist movie is much better than those type of films. And you don't have to worry about negative consequences of it potentially making the audience take liberal views like the all the countless human trafficking movies that they're doing. I think in all of Angel Studios, like every movie is about human trafficking. And it's like, what? <laughs> uh, I think there's other uh, issues uh, that are going on right now. But in any case, uh, we've got a one from Appalachian. Quick one. I've seen, I've seen posts and polls showing how millennial age voters t- still continue to vote left and even Zoomers have become more conservative than them. I saw a post stating that boomers were worse than the silent generation. Gen X may be worse than boomers and millennials are worse than Gen X and social attitudes and feeling of entitlement. What causes degradation in each generation? Do you see a turning point in Gen Z? Some of these polls you should be a little skeptical of. I mean, it is natural over time that generations become more uh, liberal. One is that it's not simply one is that generations are becoming more diverse. Millennials are far more diverse than Gen X. Gen X are more diverse than boomers, etc. So some of it's more increasing racial diversity, which they don't try to admit. Others is that younger generations are more less established or have less behaviors that make them more conservative. Like boomers, all married with kids. Gen X, a little bit less so, but still so. Millennials, still staying single. And this is a bigger problem for women uh, and making them liberal than it is for men. I'm going to write an article eventually about the childless cat men that some conservatives are trying to make as a problem, but it's like, it's far less of a problem than a childless cat ladies. They're trying to do this because it's more uh, socially appropriate to attack childless cat men and see them as a problem. And conservatives are just geared for this because all the young women hate and sells, uh, regardless of whether they're conservative or, or liberal. And so they want to say the real problem are incels, not childless cat ladies. And also a lot of these guys who are in conservatism uh, take a lot of um, social... Um, or they see a lot of value and social status in being owning uh, incels and being like, oh, I'm a married man at 40. I'm way better than you incels at 22. Or, so they want to imagine that that's a lot. It's a lot uh, better for winning internet arguments and it's a lot more um, less controversial to attack the Charles Catman. But in any case, that's another topic. Any uh, So those are the two big issues is that one... Increasing racial diversity makes them more liberal. Two, younger generations are less likely to get married and have kids, which are a predictive factor in making them more conservative, or generally a factor in making them more conservative. So I'd say that, and some of it's also the third factor is that there's generally greater social liberalism among younger generations, especially towards gays and and other things. They become more tolerant of this. What's happening among millennials at least when I was growing up, which in the 2000s, depending on when you grew up, if you grew up mostly in the 2000s or pre-second term Obama term, you weren't that politicized. It was really post-2012 where millennials then got heavily politicized, or especially if they were younger and in college at that time, and then even after. Is that was when they got really heavily politicized as the 2010s got along. But in the tw- 2000s, they weren't even that politicized. Even though uh, there were Iraq war protests, that was a very small minority thing because people didn't have to worry about the draft. It wasn't like Vietnam where everyone was politicized by this. 
And a lot of boomers became more conservative once Vietnam was over. And then they're like, okay, now I can focus on other issues. And boomers became more conservative in contrast to the stereotype that they built in the 60s. And also, thing to remember about boomers, due to the fact that they're only 46, they're from 46 to 64, most boomers were not even old enough to be around, for, were not old enough to be involved in the 60s protests. Most of their culture is the 70s, not the 60s. Very different culture in the 70s as well. Political culture and everything else. So that was when they grew up. But in any case, millennials weren't as politicized then. I've talked about how there's been a depolitization of Gen X, of Gen Zers. But still, Gen Zers in high school are receiving more political content or more engaged with political content than millennials were in the 2000s. And what's, that, what's happening with that is that there's becoming a massive gender gap where Gen Z males are pretty conservative and Gen Z females are the most left-wing demographic in America. And so that's creating that divide. Now, some people are, think this is a white pill because all these Gen Z chads are then going to win over these Gen Z feminists and then turn them into right-wing extremists. Uh, I think it's not in case. It's like you're imagining all these incels somehow winning over the feminists and turning them a right-wing extremist. I think in some cases, there's more influence of the woman making the male libtarded than the, than the reverse. Because uh, I've seen enough relationships where the, the man is totally henpecked by the woman and he can't even leave the home without the permission of his girlfriend. So, you know, you, you have a lot of those cases, which a lot of right-wing Twitter doesn't want to admit as, uh, as existing. They have to think that every right wing guy is a total giga chat and these women just want to be turned right wing. I, I mean, there's there are cases like that, but I think really over time, I'm going to have a column about this eventually is that the gender war or war of the sexes is just going to get worse uh, as they're politically polarized and they're not marrying and not having kids. And that there's just going to be this complete war once millennials become middle aged. I mean, they're already there, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> my generation's there. Everyone hates millennials, though. That That's going to get worse when everyone's 40, no kids, and they're unmarried. And Gen Z is going to continue that. It's going to be very much like South Korea, the war of the sexes. The problem is, is that we're. it's going to be tough to mobilize the men here. Because the men... Everyone's like, this is a white pill that all these guys are conservative and right-wing views. I think this... it's. It's more dampening the black pill rather than that because the women are more likely to vote than the men. Like, sure, these 19-year-old, 20-year-old guys might be conservative right-wing or have right-wing social views, but they're less likely to vote than their female peers. The female peers have already marked it down their calendar. The guys don't even have a calendar. Even when they're out of college, they're just like, oh, man, uh... I drank too much watching Monday Night Football. I can't, I gotta go to work. I'm hungover. I'm not gonna vote. Uh, I'm not feeling well today. The girl already marked it down in calendar, has a specific date, went there at uh, time and checked the ballot and has done that. The guy forgot about it. Or the girls have already done early voting. It's, it's, uh, if you're gonna choose which demographic you want to have uh, on your side, in terms of voting, you would much rather have young women on your side. And so that's going to be more of a benefit for young women. We're not going to receive as much of a benefit from young men uh, backing Republicans because it's probably the least reliable <laughs> demographic besides like Hispanics, which is another group we're winning over. I would say like young, white, single men are probably <laughs> under 30 are probably Hopefully the least uh, likely demographic to turn out to vote. And I guess it's good we're winning them over, but it's uh, not going to result in elections. I would say this one thing, uh, final thoughts on this, is that everyone hates millennials. Like it is the most universally despised generation. Even millennials hate millennials. And so everyone wants to get on this idea that Gen... I see this on like right-wing Twitter a lot, is that Gen X and Zoomers are based and Millennials are cringe. Because, and it allows Gen Xers who want to see themselves as young... It, there's an age hierarchy for right-wing Twitter. Is that boomers are old, 
somehow Gen Xers are young, Millennials are middle-aged, and then, uh, well, if they have kids, then they turn young, even if they're like 38. I, I don't understand that, but just understand that everyone we don't like is middle-aged, but uh, anyone we do like is young, even if they're 50. Uh, I, there is a prominent right-wing account that is 50 and said that... Um, her and her siblings are turning middle age, and I'm like, uh, if you're almost 50, you've been middle age for a while. <laughs> but that's just some of the Gen Xers. Gen Xers don't want to admit they're middle age, but everyone accuses millennials of being middle age. And then Zoomers are young, uh, and all these groups want to attack millennials. And then all the millennials will either pretend they're Gen X or they're Zoomers. Even if they're in their 30s, they'll pretend they're Zoomers. I'm like the only millennial who, pretend, who is stands up for being a millennial. But uh, there's too much millennial hate. All the trends that we see bad going on in millennials is going to be even worse among Gen Z. But there are there is something different. And the young men have been politicized at an earlier age. And they're more likely to exhibit right wing views when they're 21 than millennials were at that age. But... The bigger issue is that so are the women. And the women are exhibiting political views at a... Uh, at the complete opposite end of politics. Um, so that's that. Once again, there's two columns to come out of this. Um, they'll, they'll be out there eventually. I've got a lot of column ideas, but so the two are disputing the child, like why we shouldn't worry about Charles Cotman. It's it's more of a, a sign of how dysfunctional our society is rather than they're going to be a really nefarious demographic. And two... Uh, the war of the sexes are going to get worse. So uh, those are two columns to come from that. So great question from Appalachian. A lot of great, as we said, we've got a lot of great questions. Um, we've got three questions from Dollar Bill. I think, I think, um, I'm going to save two of them. I'm going to save uh, well, one's just an IQ supplement request, and then the other, I'm going to save the other one for the IQ supplement. Anyway, I'm going to ask for one question from him, or answer one question, not ask. His, th his question and I'm gonna answer is, what are your thoughts on Biden putting on a MAGA hat and telling voters don't eat cats and dogs? It was so bizarre and so out of character for him. I had no idea what to make of it. A tweet I saw made the point that if Biden's presidency had been this magnanimous towards MAGA, instead of calling them insurrectionists and white supremacists, Trump would be facing a much harder road to election. That is true. I think it's just that, you know, Biden just doesn't give a shit anymore. I mean, he is senile and... He just wants to be liked by people. And he saw that it was like a hostile crowd. So he's just like, whatever, I don't care. I'm going to throw on this hat. I also am really pissed off at Kamala for the uh, putting the knife in my back. And, you know, there would probably be, you know, Biden wants Kamala to win, but he would still get joy out of seeing her lose because it would prove him right. It's like, well, you should have stuck with me. You should have stuck with me rather than with with her. They would like her to stay because they're worried that a Trump DOJ would go after the family. Kamala DOJ would not go after the Biden. So they wouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, that would be their main benefit to it. And they could be, you know, everyone would celebrate them as like, wow, thanks for doing the right thing. You allowed Democrats to stay in power. But he would still get a joy out of it. He just doesn't give a shit anymore. He's like senile. And he's just like, you know what? Whatever. I'm going to have the hat. And you know what? He seemed to be really enjoying himself. He seemed to be having a ball with these people. And so I just think he, you know, he likes, you know, he's, he's a politician. He likes making, pe you know, making people smile and interacting with them. And if putting on the hat was the way to do that. And don't eat cats and dogs. Uh, I think it's just like some of a senile way... Uh, and he also knew that that was the way to win over the crowd. He still has that enough brain functioning to realize what wins over a crowd. <coughs> and the crowd seemed to love it. They're like, all right, he's going MAGA. And so I think it's just that. He just doesn't give a shit. He's, you know, his presidency now is just taking beach vacations and having these photo ops. And so it's, it is what it is. Um, I, so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's pretty funny to see Biden like that. I, I would say I, I would take much um, see much into it than that. Then it's just him. He's senile. He doesn't give a shit anymore. He wanted to please the crowd, and that's what he did. 
But it's great optics for us because Trump the night before said he hates Kamala. And guess what he does? He puts on a MAGA hat literally within 12 hours of his, that statement. So that was pretty good. Now we got a question from Myopic Eeyore. And Myopic Eeyore says, Do you think that never Trumpers will ever leave the GOP? They're endorsing Harris, but so many of them staff congressional offices in the National Park. No, they have been leaving the party. They've just been leaving it uh, a lot. There are so many never Trumpers back in the 2010s and they would just never leave. But all these people just hopped on board to the Democrats. Like look at David French. David French was still a well-respected conservative pundit in 2018. Now every conservative hates him and he's just a liberal. Look at Liz Cheney. Look at all these people who got kicked out of office. If you're never Trump, you have no position within the GOP. You've been purged. They've been purging a lot of these people. You've either had to change your politics to be pro-Trump or you've been kicked out of the party. And so that's it for everyone. Uh, so I think that they have mostly left the party. I mean, there's still people who are in their hearts, never Trumpers, but they have to pretend to be Trump, be pro-Trump. Now, if Trump wins in November, never Trumpers are just done. Never going to be any faction. They're never returning as a party. And that's mostly a good thing. We're never going to see Jonah Goldberg and all these guys who, you know, Jonah Goldberg tries to be a moderate never Trumper. Well, he's still, unlike David French and other, and like Bill Kristol, he still supports all the Republicans, but is anti-Trump. The other ones are just like Bill Kristol is now straight down ballot pro-Democrat. And I think David French is as well. And so are a lot of these other guys. And so is pretty much Liz Cheney. Uh, in addition. And Liz Cheney apparently thinks she could get a cabinet spot <clears throat> in a Kamala administration. Now, if he loses, you could see some of these people slither back, uh, but I don't think that they would have many powerful positions that they did. But if Trump wins, it's game over for them. They're just done. And even if a lot of the congressional staffers are way more right wing than they were five or six years ago. You know, they're reading my Twitter account. They're reading even people further to the right's Twitter account. They're much, much, much more right wing than they were even a few years ago. And that's just a change. I will say this in, with a Gen Z versus millennial is Zoomer conservatives are the ones who are really into this stuff, like getting involved with college Republicans, staffing, Hill uh, on the, uh, being Hill staffers and other things. They are much more right wing the millennials were millennials at that time you know i grew up around them or you know didn't grow up around them worked with them they were all either libertarians or neocons they sucked while with zoomers they're all engaging with right wing and dissonant right ideas so that's my white pill i want to offer to you to myopic eeyore now we got um i'm going to answer one question from preston preston sent um, it's on a similar question. So I'll answer this from Preston's. It's similar to the last question. He said, why do you think so many establishment Republicans like Bush, Romney, Paul Ryan have stayed quiet in this election instead of endorsing Harris like Dick Cheney, Kasich and other neocons? Who do you think that they are voting for? Uh, well, I, Paul Ryan and Romney have not been, <laughs> they're basically voting for, uh, Kamala. Paul Ryan has been on TV. He's like, I'm never voting for Trump. We got to make sure Trump loses for the good of the party. Um, George W. Bush, the Bush family, they, they still have hopes of their relatives running for office and being within the Republican patronage network. And they don't want to lose that. Like George P. Bush, who is a uh, son of Jeb, still wants to do Republican politics. He still has ambitions for that. And the family coming out openly and saying we're voting for Kamala would destroy his political career. And it would destroy the political careers of any other Bush who wants to run for office. And so there's still a lot of members in the Bush family who want to run for office. And they know they can only do that through the GOP. So I think that's why Bush, Romney and Paul Ryan haven't really been silent, but I think the Bushes have been silent solely for that reason. Primarily for George P. Bush, but I think there are other Bushes who are wanting to run uh, in Republican politics. It'd be like the Kennedys. RFK is kind of like the black sheep of the family, so it doesn't matter, but it'd be like a major Kennedy, like Joe Kennedy the third. 
saying I'm voting for Trump. That would destroy the Kennedy's ability to ever run for office within the Democratic politics. It's like their guy. So that's why all the Bushes are staying silent is for the hopes of their family still getting positions and still running for office as Republicans. And with that, that will be our final question today. Any other questions will be for the mailbag. We're going to have a fantastic mailbag this week, so be on the lookout for that. So that is it for today. We're going to be having our normal schedule like this week. Going to have a great column tomorrow, great mailbag Wednesday, great column Thursday, and an incredible IQ supplement Friday. So be all on the lookout for that. So until next time, stay respected.